thanks everybody for showing up, especially since I know HD is over in the, in the other room, and I, I promise to speak more slowly than he does. <laughs> So uh, this is about role-based access control, so if, if this is not a really exciting topic for you, the, the exits are here. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm going to talk about mainly, and actually I'm kind of disappointed that Jim Manico isn't here because he hates our back with a purple passion. So I expected he would be like up front and center to, to heckle me on this. Um, he wants to know if, if he believes that our back is dead or it should be dead, uh, he wants to do it in himself. Uh, and I'm here to talk about how, yeah, maybe not so much. So I've uh, I had my massage in the speaker room, and I had a beer, and now I'm just like all ready to go. Uh, so at, at the same, not quite because it was still there. So yeah, but, uh, pretty close actually. Um, so our back isn't dead. It does smell sort of off though. So let's give it a makeover. Um, the old version of RBAC and probably in a lot of legacy systems that you have seen, it was just a group of entitlements, the same thing as a group, pretty much. Um, and, you know, if you were a director, you were in the director's group, and you would just add roles whenever you needed more access, and of course the administrator, whoever needed access to everything, just had all the roles, and that was it. So what's really wrong with that? Um, first of all, is really, really based in the commercial world. So it assumed that you were either an employee of an enterprise or you were a customer of an enterprise. And it didn't have room for anything in between. And so, of course, my, my brothers in arms um, who work with me at the Texas Education Agency know that for the public sector, for uh, education, for a lot of other organizations, especially when they're very fragmented and distributed, um, that's just not the case. And when half of your business is about dealing with people on the outside in a bunch of different capacities, then this, just putting everybody in a little, in a little group is not going to work. Um, and then, of course, with some of these roles, you know, they have weird legacy names, and you have to try to figure out, you know, who's in the Spider-Man group? Why, why, why does this person even have this access? Uh, and it was really all about the entitlements, not about the name. It doesn't reflect different axes of governance. It's not the axes of governance, although that would be pretty cool if you were like chopping things. Um, but I'll talk about that in a minute. And it doesn't support context switching, which is what we really need for a lot of stuff today. So exhibit A, when you're working for, on, or on behalf of more than one organization, for example, you're an insurance broker, um, and you are connecting to an application, but you're representing different insurance companies each time, um, there may be legal requirements for separation of duties, um, or like at TEA, we have the, we have a bunch of different organizations, districts, institutes of higher education, um, there other agencies, um, and some people would work on behalf of you know a bunch of different ones, or you know at the same time. But they could they had to have separate sessions each time. They had to be very clear about who they were representing at that time. So you just can't give them union of entitlements that. That's just not good. Uh, the HR system is another one. Uh, you know, it, you may be the administrator of the HR system and you're an employee at the same time. Uh, so you have to be able to switch those and it's not, it's not a good thing when you are the employee and you have all the power, including the power to give yourself a raise. Although that is awesome when that happens. QA tester. It's one of these things that you know we all know about, we all live about, and it's, it just gets ignored, the fact that QA has to pretend to be everybody in order to test every single part of, a, of an application. And that's the other problem, uh, especially if you're trying to scan an application and you have a bunch of different roles, you have to have the tool logging in with different ones at each time so you can make sure you're covering as many pages as possible. So that's a pain in the butt. And the other one is when federation isn't good enough. It's not just the case of you completely trust this organization. Any users they put in are fine with you. You're just going to let them, you know, have access. Uh, that that doesn't that doesn't always work, especially if you are responsible for controlling the uh, the information that they're accessing and you have legal responsibilities for protecting it. You can't uh, you can't just transfer that liability to the other organization. You still have to keep some of it. So even though you don't want to manage all those other users, 
And you know, let's face it, the, the people who usually make most decisions about access don't have time to actually make those decisions, so they kind of push them off on somebody else. Um, if, if you don't have time to do that, you have to find a way to let them manage the users, but you still are the final gatekeeper on whether they have access. And uh, I don't know why you TEA guys are here. You know all this already. <laughs> We've been living with it. And of course, every, and every deputy or administrator assistant ever who you know, has to step in and do something as somebody else um, on Fridays when the boss goes to the golf course or, or developers. And that's, that's another big example that we never ever talk about. That's, you know, that they have to be able to play every different role as well, especially when they're troubleshooting in production, which we all know never happens. Uh, so what we really need are context-specific entitlements, and I'll talk <coughs> more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, we need clear governance. We need to be very clear about who's making what decisions that pertain to the access and who's making what uh, assertions when it pertains to the individual user. And of course, it needs to be flexible and extensible. Um, I recommend yoga. So let's talk about context plus governance. If you think about it, there, there may be an authority who vouches for who you are in a particular context. Like they say, yes, you are a student at this university. And we know because we run the university, uh, you know, we issued you the student ID, we know who you are and we know that you should have access. Then there's somebody who actually owns the data, is responsible for that or for the application, who makes the decision of, yes, anybody who is doing something in a student capacity should have access to this application. So if you split those off, especially when you have a bunch of different contexts coming in with a bunch of different authorities behind them, and again, using TEA's example, you know, if you have a district, you have a campus, um, you have an auditor, um, you have, who else, who else do we have? You, you know, you have internal departments, you have different geographic regions if you're a, a multinational enterprise. Um, all of those are going to make different assertions about an individual and why they should have access to a particular set of resources. And, and they're different. If you try to follow, funnel these all up to one decision maker somewhere in the enterprise, um, it, you know, it's impossible. You have a, a user base of 50,000, um, you're gonna be up all night. So the identity authority that just, and I'm just describing it this way, is, is someone who asserts who you are for a, a particular purpose. And then they give you a set of context attributes. So they say, yes, you are a healthcare professional. Uh, yes, you are licensed. Um, this guy is now working as an analyst for me, by the way, which is so awesome. Uh, yes, you are a parent of the aforementioned student. Uh, you are the author of this book, and therefore you have rights to you know, edit it or, or something like that. So any of these and all of these can funnel in at the same time. So it's not about who you are, it's about what you can do. And that's why I want to, I want to suggest that we think more at, of roles as more along the lines of functionality. So you're performing a function, it is stuck down by different attributes, like which organization you're representing, or you know, which, which level you are, you know, you're not allowed to do anything, any transactions over five million or, or something like that. The, so the scope applies to the function, and then there's a final authorization uh, that comes from somebody who's actually granting the access. So let, let's just use a really simple sort of um, example. <laughs> Professor Plum in the kitchen with a lead pipe. And you know, there are a couple of, there, you know, could be in the kitchen, could be in the library, could be with a rope, with a candlestick. I guess you could sort of, you can sort of drive the rules, business rules here. But in your, if you're in the kitchen, you can use a candlestick, but if you're in the library, it has to be with a rope. Um, does anybody see any problem with this, this sort of diagram? Other than the color or something. You almost have to let the pipe in his pocket. Uh, yeah, or something like that. The, the, the problem is, is he killing or is he being killed? Because that kind of matters a lot. So let's, let's put that in there. Um, and, and this is the context. 
is he, because this is the function, is he killing or is he being killed in the kitchen with the lead pipe? Now this sort of, again, sort of implies that you can only be killed in the library and you can only kill in the kitchen, so that doesn't really work. Let's expand that a little bit more. Um, if we split this off some more, then you will have probably a kitchen authority who says, you know, if, when you're doing this in the kitchen, I, I will make up the rules as to what you can do with what, to whom. Um, and then you will have a, a library authority who will also make those kinds of business logic decisions. So you're associated if you're working for an enterprise. And again, you know, you could be a citizen, you could be registering your car, you could have a lot of different roles. Um, but let's say you're associated with an organization. So it vouches for you and it, it approves your functions. It says we would like you to do this on behalf of us. Um, if you own the data, you are approving access to it by the organization and, and by proxy those individuals that that organization is vouching for. And you can be any of these roles, citizen, student, subscriber, editor, parent, uh, and, and all at the same time. And this, is, this matters a lot. So for example, in HIPAA, if you are a, a doctor, your name is not confidential. If it's a patient, it is. And you can become a patient really quickly with a little trip to the ER. So that context switch has to be, um, has to be visible. You have to prepare for it. You have to be able to handle it. This is the sort of thing that I, I, I wrote a paper on uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, something that I call a dating event. And this is where any sort of data characteristics change such that the security requirements change. So for example, again, in, uh, in either HIPAA or FERPA, anything that can be used to identify an individual is confidential. So let's say longitudinal data. If you get the right set of data together, then it can identify the individual. And at that point, when you've done that particular query, then that information becomes, becomes confidential. Uh, think about a press release. Before you send it out, it's got to be confidential and you're running DLP to make sure that Project Biscuit is not being mentioned anywhere. Um, you, know, you may have encryption in place. And then all of a sudden, when you make the business decision to release it, it's the opposite. You want it to spread as, and as far and as wide as possible. So that's a data event. Uh, the same data, but massive context switch. And so again, the functions in the scope are different depending on the context. Now, a lot of you have probably had to deal with roles, and, and these are some signs and symptoms that things are just not working too well. Um, they keep getting more entitlements. You keep adding you know, additional permissions to the same old role, um, or you just give everybody admin. And what does admin even mean? Anyway, it could be somebody who's the administrator of a, within an application. If it's somebody's job, for example, to roll up data, uh, it could be somebody outside of the application whose job it is, you know, to to start the processes to keep it running. Um, or admin could be uh, the administrative assistant down the hall who has a very limited role. It could be an intern. So uh, I hate the word admin. That's that's very confusing anyway. Um, and then, you know, in a lot of organizations, some people just have legacy roles and they all have them because at some point or another, they had to do a function that that role allowed them to do. So it doesn't mean anything anymore. And of course, you know, the less said about Active Directory, the better. Caveat, do not, and I know this is a little bit late if you already have an, an application that is using roles, but if you're gonna write one, do not ever, ever, ever create roles based on organizational structure. And why? Two words. Reorg. Mm -hmm. You have to recode your application every time <coughs> you have a reorg. You're going to be a very unhappy person. And uh, yeah, I don't have to mention the other two words, merge -er. Uh Anytime your company's merging with another one and you're restructuring everything, again, you want your application and its roles to be as flexible as possible so you can adapt to that. Also, do not map a role to a physical device. Not that many, probably none of you would think about doing that, but I'm just saying it just in case. Because the enterprise is getting increasingly abstracted from the device. 
in, in the future, I think we will all be sitting around with a little pile of, of phones and tablets on a coffee table, and every member of the family will just pick up the closest one and do whatever they need to do. So uh, that, that's the end, the end game of BYOD. We're sort of in the middle there now, where everything is you know, getting abstracted and, and getting blurry. With the cloud, it shouldn't matter which servers you're using, you shouldn't know or care, and the same thing with the device. The, the, the application shouldn't have to know or care what you're, how you're accessing it. Because deep down, the roles reflect our assumptions about what the business function is supposed to be, what these people are supposed to be doing, what they're not supposed to be doing, who they are, and they usually as, as, assume that they're going to stay that way. And that uh, you know, after five years or ten years, and you have the same uh, application that is trying to do the job of a bunch of other business functions that got thrown on top of it. Um, you know, these old roles are going to be too static to be useful. So just uh, you know, obviously you have to write a role that describes the functionality that somebody is going to to be carrying out. But just keep in mind that it's not going to stay that way. But isn't that like a flexibility of implementation problem? So if you're hard coding the roles into your program, then you can't change them. That's 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 a that's a that's an implementation issue, right? So it's not yeah. a problem with roles as as such. Exactly, exactly. It's it's in the way that you use them to go care of Uh Yeah, and that's that's exactly what like Jim Manic goes on about. You know, if you hard code these roles in. Um, you know, you should be able, you should be separating in, in your fundamental design, you should be uh, separating out the dynamic elements so that you can change them more easily. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, it's not that roles are bad, it's, it's, how, it's how you use them that can be good or bad. So to sum up, the, yeah, our back is not dead. It, it's not going to be dead. We have so many legacy applications that are using them anyway. It's just that my hope in the future as we add them and as we design them, that we can look at them from a, a different point of view, to look at them as functionality rather than you know, somebody's position in an organization or somebody's role, because um, that's always going to change. Um, th the other thing is that in the enterprise, it used to be that enterprises used very different software from what their employees use privately. So if you were using SAP, you knew you were working. That's not the case anymore, because so many enterprises are also using Dropbox, Google Docs, Everybody's using Word. So the only way to tell what your business data is, it's not that you can say if it's in a Word document, it belongs to us because you, know, you can use Word anywhere. It shouldn't matter where it was generated, at what time of day, you know, where they were located, on which machine it was generated. The only thing that matters anymore is the actual data inside. And you have to be able to look at it and say, well, this is talking about something that we as an enterprise are doing, so this is business data. Um, that's that's how slippery it's getting and it's probably going to stay that way in the future. So I wanted to open this up actually to more discussion for those of you who have to who have to work with us. And I'm sorry about this, I just couldn't I couldn't resist. Is there anybody who is actually working with, struggling with this this kind of thing? I'm working with. Yeah. Since it's haven't released so we don't know. Sorry, it's it hasn't released. Oh, it hasn't released yet. So, what what are you working on? Uh, we recently uh, integrated with the the TIL, that's the um, TA security system, with the application details that's using educators to apply for that's, that's right. yeah for yeah. all the um, certifications. So we use the RMAC methodology, mm -hmm. and but we add extra layer called permission. So it's kind of adding flexibility to the role. The role can change its function, it can get reorg, but the permission to the application is kind of stay static at this point. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a mixed match. Uh, we think it would work, but we'll see how it works. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, because I know that is it, this is a complete rewrite of that spec, or are you it's exactly just, what's there? Just using the uh, security function, it's a rewrite on security. Yeah, so yeah, and using what's in teal. Yeah, so, so we don't have to do too much uh, remake for the last application. Yeah. Let me throw something out there that, that I've just in, in the last uh, year or so of, of trying to work with different folks to, to, to communicate and, and integrate systems. Um, 
So a problem I've, I've run into that, that you may be able to help with or somebody else may be able to help with is, is just using the word role. Mm -hmm. Because in security, I think, I, I may be aggressive, but I think that in general, most of us mean the same thing in this room by role. But nobody else in the business seems to understand the same thing by role. And so you, know, you, you were just saying it in your kind of summary, summation or conclusion that if we, if we think about role as a uh, job function or organizational type, organizational structure or job title, uh, we, we, we're, we're planning for failure kind of thing. We're not doing it right. But that's exactly what everybody else seems to understand about role. Role is job title, you know? And so right away, when I'm having a conversation, I, I finally learned this, is to say, look, when I say role, I don't mean job title. Yeah. I mean something else. Yeah. Yeah. So is there another word that so, anybody? So I mean, so what, what, what I think the problem what you're talking about is that there's, there's role as, as a requirement, as a descriptive word about describing a requirement around authorization, and role as an implementation. So our back is a particular implementation. It is a, it is a security methodology yeah, security yeah, yeah. system. And you, I, I absolutely agree with you when you talk with business folks, when you talk about role, they immediately go to social grouping, what's yeah. their job yeah. function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, think, I think that, um, and I, I'll, 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 full disclosure, I did a talk on this yesterday. Cool. So, Dang, I missed it. I was in Vegas yesterday. <laughs> well, it's it'll there'll be all the talks will be going up online, but the for me the challenge was and, and part of the the the, the, the uh, genesis of, of the talk and, and uh, so there's actually a very long white paper I did on a friend of mine who's got a lot more app dev experience than I do was going through a whole and this doesn't happen very often. Uh, I worked at a company we completely got rid of our old back end system and brought in a new one. Now, I work for a financial services firm, so there is a lot of authorization decisions that need to be made. Now, we took essentially an RBAC process, or an RBAC approach to, to building it all out, but that alone wasn't enough. So, I mean, doing it just by job description, that was part of it, but there was a large part of it that was actually really determined by, you know, basically what client group you were working with. So, I, I work for a stock brokerage. Everything in the brokerage business, at least our business at our company, is geared around what's called a broker ID. This is actually an SCC thing that you have to have a broker ID associated with every client that you have. Set so out brokers would have multiple broker IDs, people would share, they wouldn't share, it was it was just a complete, you know, brawl <coughs> in you know, how brokers basically grouped all these clients together. But that was a separate grouping, that was totally separate from role. And you know, we're working through this whole thing. Um, where I where I landed with with my friend Carl, where we, we landed at this work was that kind of in terms at least of in terms of extracting requirements around functional security requirements, which are primarily for business users around authorization, we said set all that aside and start talking about things in terms of constraints, constraints on functions within the system, constraints either on functions either on what functions you can access what data you can access or combinations of those two and you can get really complicated really quickly. And as you know, so the other thing that we did was, you know, we threw out, hey, you actually have to do this um, with clear patterns. Because there's common patterns that we've seen, both of us, from just kind of our experience of, you know, things actually people have these desires of how they want authorization to happen and they fall into like they do tend to fall into like little clusters. So we talk about a requirements patterns in, in the paper. And you know, it's 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 kind of it's again it's a role a role our our back is a great solution for implementing roles, but but that's not enough. You need more than that. Um, you can use our back to implement non-role based systems, but you know again it's it's separating the implementation from the actual requirements. And I think that really you know the blurring of those two is kind of what has what what led to the failure of a lot of uh, a lot of our back. So. Sorry, sorry. No, that's great. That's great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, you, you might want to get together. Yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. That our role implementation is, is really beyond the job title, but of course it's included job title because we end up have a lot of uh, read only and the writable. So <laughs> you have job title you can write, but a lot of people they just want to view. So that's beyond job title. <clears throat> what I, I guess the challenge, the way I see it, is that you know the, it's, it's a matter of instead of taking one person and trying to figure out what all they should be able to access, and then you have to go through all the like our security people has to give permissions for this person to be able to do all the stuff. 
instead of having to just individually, you know, add that person, it's easier to profile somebody, to profile something that says with the roles, if you want to call it that, or groups, so that it's it's easier just to uh, grant them that role or that grouping, mm -hmm. and, it, and it makes it a lot quicker to you know for the to do those permissions. Um, but I guess it's you know if we're talking about that's not the best way of doing it. What is the solution? What are we we're talking about issues, but what is the best way to do it? What is the best practices in this case? So I've done a lot of looking around what's out there for implementations and. But as far as I can tell, everybody does it differently in every application they've ever built. Um, and, you know, if SAP has its own flavor of authorization. You know, this this other system, you know, this other brokerage platform that work have had their own system. And there's and there's there's never been, as far as I can tell, any effort, or as far as I'm able to find, any effort to actually bring some kind of um, engineering discipline to how we build these systems. Um, I, I, the other thing is, I have a hard time talking to the identity management folks since they speak foreign language um, and, and I think part of the challenge is, is just the level of complexity that you end up with with all these various permutations of who you are what time it is you know all the different constraints I mean it's almost an infinite number of combinations and if you try to tackle them all you're not you're not going to succeed although I will put a plug in for a particular product um, uh, which is still out there it's now owned by Dell um, but BitQ Keystone um, for enterprises actually uh, is an attempt to solve this problem. I think there's other solutions out there. Um, uh, so XACML or SACML, right, is another attempt to solve this problem, to be, you know, the Swiss Army knife of authorization. Now, that alone is probably not going to work for you because, again, it's a powerful language. And if you, if the, the complexity gets out of hand, having, you know, Having worked in security and managed a, a, a team of security administrators that have to do provisioning, and you know this was like there was I mean it was a, a level of reprovisioning of access that was under constant churn. Um, I'm very well aware of the costs of setting up complicated security. So it, I, for me, I think the answer is something that is sackable based, like BitQ Keystone that allows you to basically externalize all that authorization from completely outside of, of your application. So the developers don't have to worry about it. The developers can't screw it up and it gives you the flexibility to change over time. But also you have to do that within very clear templates, right? So you have to decide what templates are important to you, what, what meets your security requirements, and you have to stick to those patterns. You have to stick those patterns really hard and basically almost have to charge people money you know, if they want to develop a new pattern, a new template of, of access control, of authorization that they want to use. So. Yeah, and, and I don't think we're saying that, you know, you, you shouldn't group entitlements because obviously you need right. to be able to do right. that. But I, I would suggest doing it more with a view towards what function are you performing, not, you know, what title do you have. So you, you may be yes. proving yes. purchases, but if you, you know, if your right. you know, business rules are going to say if you're above a certain rank, then you can, you know, prove this, this financial amount of, of transactions, and that's fine, but that should be a scope that, you know, that goes under the role. So, touching on that, uh, what you've got there is, it sounds like there's a role around approved purchases, uh, but there's a role about deciding who gets to uh, approve how big the purchase and yeah, things like yeah. that, and it may be that today any member of this department has rights to do certain things, but after the reorg or after the merger, mm. that changes. Um, I, I've seen this fail in, in one interesting way, which is the clone permissions from failure mode, uh, where you suddenly give up on defining roles at all, and you just say, well, I gotta do whatever so-and-so does, because so-and-so right. is going on vacation, so give me whatever they've got. Give me the Joe role. Right, yeah. and, and this, this ties in with the legacy roles, where Joe also used to be the guy 10 years ago who ordered coffee, and so now you get the <laughs> coffee for the company role because they never got rid of it. Yeah, um, yeah. One area of research that uh, I read about and we're, we're actually playing around with a little bit now, uh, there's this uh, language called uh, or it's, a, it's a platform for, for distributed uh, authentication decision making. Uh, and it, it's built on data log. So you're doing basically uh, logic programming around uh, deciding who gets to what and being able to distribute that. Uh, 
uh, to somebody else. So for example, in a Sutay-based system, you'd be able to say that the head of purchasing decides which departments are going to have which limits. Uh, and now when a purchasing decision gets made, it checks, you, you go and check, is this person allowed to make purchases? Yes. And you say, well, how big a purchase are they going to get to make? And it says, that's delegated over to so-and-so to make the decision. And the system that so-and-so inputs their information into uh, also speaks to Tay, and therefore the decision is rolled right through, uh, and it gets made. And when you change departments or change roles, or when the mapping of which departments have which limits changes, it changes automatically everywhere. You don't have this hard-coded mess laying around. Uh, it's an open source project. You can go. How do you spell that? Uh, S O U T E I. Uh, it's uh, it's a dialect of Finder. Uh, it's available. You can, the, the first version was written in Scheme. The latest is Haskell. Uh, there are you can run it on Java, sort of if you want to port it to, uh, to one of the, the languages like that in there. But there. It, it's, it's describing the system, so you can implement it yourself. It is not, you don't have to use their language. Uh, but it's, it's interesting research and definitely interesting paper worth reading. Cool. It's so interesting if this one is just a common transition problem. Uh, easy to do cost grade access, right? Beginning and rural level, cost grade access, and easy to implement. And then finally, our application, when the last one, we need a fine grade access. Fine grade access now, scope is introduced. You must put in an asset. You have a role, but then we command you what by that target group. Not only function, rules with what function permission you have, but all which group. They are also certain limitation, time limitation, location limitation, all those things introduce that part of scope. And then when a, com a project becomes complex, you know, so many features that you put in. In the organization, one time we have scope is a broad use group, so we cannot. Uh, you can find the users in that department. Right? You, have, so you can do certain things, but only that department. All that group, then it gets sense. It's hard to model now. So what do I model user by group, by organization, by department, all that kicks in. So, <coughs> it would be very safe, and it's more about, because we have a, these disparate uh, applications that may handle um, authorization uh, differently that it, we have these use cases for each one of the, the, the applications and we're trying to really just map map it to something that meet, is meaningful to our uh, identity management and so there's and I guess that's where the gap is right it's we, we need to have something and I, I don't know if these tools that you're talking about are doing can do something like that where it doesn't matter what it's called for these use cases and these applications but we want to be able to say this person needs to do this 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 and then somehow it maps to that. Is that what we're kind of so, I mean, strive so, for? So the, the tool, the, the, the Sackable-based tools will let you pretty much map anything to anything, because you can, I think, from, so there's there's role-based there's role based access control, and now there's also, we also have attributes, attribute-based access control, and it's my understanding as far as, you know, as far as I haven't done a lot of research on this, that, 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 uh, that Sackable basically will do everything. Is that, are you familiar with Sackable? Is that, statement. I, I, I wouldn't commit to it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's very powerful language. Yeah, yeah. But but I mean, for me, I think a lot of the challenge is, and we faced this when we had to literally go out to everybody in the company and said, "What do your users need access to?" The first thing they said was, "Well, you're the security people. You tell us." <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're like, uh, no. So I mean, even just extracting from them, you know, what what those requirements are was a huge challenge. And that was, and so that's that's actually what we tackle in the white paper first. So we, you know, we even we haven't even really gotten as far as, you know, we've we've looked at possible implement implementations. We've mentioned that in the paper, but I mean, we don't even really have a standard a standard approach to um, gathering those requirements in the first place. So we got to understand what is it that people need and express it in a way that the security people can understand. The practice. Normally, they always use combined or hybrid. They always use dual based one plus actual based one. If you not more will work. Yes. That's not good enough. They must have combined. And the low based one serves as a common base. The actual uh, based one is a fine way access. Right, but and I think I think part of part of the thing is too is that you know it's not always uh, it's you, 
sometimes it's actually attributes of the data itself that actually dictate the access rather than the attributes of the person. Right? Okay. So I mean, it, 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 again, it's in, it's it's uh, it, that's that, I think for me that's why this is such a hard challenge. For me, I, I basically part of my frustration in, in doing this was you know role based access controls by itself is not enough. Now you can implement like an attribute based access control system within an RBAC. It's hard to do it. But but again, you know, role based by itself alone is not enough, but it also doesn't mean it's not useful because in a lot of circumstances it's very useful. And not this let's say we try to collect a good outbound to say, okay, SAS application access platform. If clients have a what application you can access, you can do linking or you can do the search for for different applications inside Salesforce. It's very hard to define the role based even say everybody's employee. So what application access? A lot of times one by one individual assignment by their managers. Mm -hmm. Right, and right. That's, yep. The even attribute done not generally the like And again that's that's a big problem, an increasing problem. There are there are a lot of uh, you know single sign on gateways for SaaS now, but the assumption is that the enterprise is is uh, trying to control what the employee can access um, going outside on behalf of that enterprise. But you know, are, are you accessing Twitter on behalf of the organization or on behalf of yourself? And you know, can you switch back and forth between those at will? And that's that's a problem that I yeah, have. Yeah, the single was the uh, issue, right? Otherwise, they could control you in the application. To sense application, you reprovision them. But if you sing the sound, you have to control you as a single sign-on problem. Yeah, and okay. you can access Facebook, but only when you're doing PR for our company. You can't go update your own page. How, how do you even try to track that? Um, so I think we're going to see, you know, so, as you said, it, it's incredibly complex. So I think, I think we're going to see some relaxing uh, around us just because, you know, the harder you, you grip, the, the more it's going to slip through your fingers. Um, so yeah, I think, I think our back is, is Schrodinger's is our back. It's both dead and not dead at the same time. As you said, it's not enough, um, and we have to we have to look at it in a different way and wield it a different way. But it's still still definitely so. This is a great conversation. Thanks, guys. Any any other thoughts? You haven't thought you haven't said anything. Well, I'm so confused about, and I have been for years about how to uh, get away from the organization. I mean, mm -hmm. just take an example. You know, Admin assistant, you know, we have admin assistants in our organization, but you know, they all, you know, do different things. I just access different data, you know, within yeah. these fifty different departments. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no one role that they can all put into that does what they need to do. So it's, it's going to have to be organizationally based at some level. And then every six months, when there's a reorder, yeah, it's extremely <coughs> frustrating. We have to, you know, rebuild your system again. I don't know how to get away from it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard. I think it, it's a lot of work, but I think one way is to try to go across and normalize roles where you can. Um, and say, yes, you know, administrative assistants are all generally doing different things, but you know, maybe they're all ordering pencils. So when you go into the pencil ordering system, you're all going to be doing the same function just on behalf of your department. Thank you. Um, but that's uh, that is a really to, to extend that example though, would it, because again, this, this this term of role we're 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 talking about as, as uh, uh, organizationally independent, right? A job title, like an admin assistant. When instead, they, in your example, the role is pencil order, mm -hmm. right? It's not admin assistant; it's pencil order. It just so happens yeah. that the pencil order in division one, five, and, and eight are pencil order, mm -hmm. and the admin assistant in two, three, and ten doesn't have pencil order, right? They only have like a uh, notebook order or something like that, you know? Yeah. It just so happens that when you do it that way, I mean, you got like 500,000 roles in a, in a hundred person organization, but I mean, maybe, you know. Yeah, that's when you back up and go orderer. Right, right. Of right, pencils. Right, of, right. To you, yeah, to go through your tree, right? Your, yeah. your, your Professor Plum tree. Right. Yeah, yeah. So is there some good uh, resource or they have to uh, model commission and roles? I would say his white paper. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. So the white paper talks a lot about requirements gathering. And again, it's 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 work that's ongoing. Um, uh, yes. 
websites. It's uh, transvasive.com. I'm John Benham. So okay, good. Yeah, please, please do look at it. I appreciate any feedback. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's a new methodology. It's based on kind of our practical experience, both Carl's and mine. Um, but you know, we, we, we don't know how well it's going to work. Um, and again, it's, it's really mainly focused on trying to understand what the requirements are. Now, part, part of the problem is, is that with, with any system, there's always going to be trade-offs, right? So the, the design solutions, you know, can't meet all of the desired requirements all of the time, right? So, I mean, you know, hearing, uh, I'm sorry, was it Tim? Tom. Tom. Tom, hearing Tom. Tom. Yeah. Todd, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Todd, hearing you talk about, about roles, I was just kind of reminded that in a big part of roles was created for the convenience of the security administration. Yes. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which this, is, well, this, is, well, this, this is important. This is important, right? Because yeah. it, it, it both allows them to do a more effective job. So it, is, it does serve the business needs better. It does give better security because fewer people have off, you know, authorization to systems they shouldn't have. But you know, if these are, I mean, roles were very much a grouping to make the security people's lives easier. I mean, they were based on the fact that those groupings exist in reality. I think, I think for me, the answer is we have to find different groupings and figure out creative ways of implementing those in our systems. So. One of the things that, that adds difficulty is when, when you start layering in delegation. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. So imagine that you are the head pencil ordering person for the company, and you want to say these administrative assistants are allowed to order pencils, and I'm letting them do that and they order off the corporate account or whatever. Uh, that makes things extra tricky. So as, as a person with an administrative assistant, you want to delegate access to my email to the administrative assistant without giving access to everybody's email or access to everybody with the same title I have is email. Mm -hmm. uh, like that. Although, to go back to the, to the question of pencil order, I mean, in some cases, you just have to say, you know, look, it's going to cost you this much money to implement, you know, controls when it <coughs> gets access to order pencils. Mm -hmm. Are you really willing to spend that money? And so, I mean, again, it's a, it's a trade-off decision that the more you tighten the controls, the more expensive it's going to get. Um, you know, if, if that's probably important in your financial system, especially if you're talking about, let's say, the wire transfer function. You know, having really tight authorization around that is probably a good idea. But you know, around other things, you know, maybe not. I mean, um, even looking at SharePoint, right? Do we really care if users do their own administration on SharePoint? I mean, how many people have really tried to solve that problem? Do that, and I don't think that can be done centrally. So I think we have to think about it. Think about uh, you know again, we can't lock everything down. We have to be careful about how we apply our authorization controls. Tying it one back together one more time to the delegation. Um, you may think that the current mobile access control system that you have, or whatever you have, doesn't do delegation. And you, most people will say, oh, it doesn't do delegation. Um, well, a lot of these systems that we're talking about controlling access to or access through your web browser. And we're sitting here at, at Apps Life USA. Uh, every time you log into your web browser, you are delegating every authority that you have that you've logged into to your web browser. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So sure. if point. you've got single sign-on across your company for all these different systems, what you've effectively said is, my web browser is now authorized to do everything I've ever been authorized to do. Uh, and anybody who takes over my web browser is also delegated the authority to do yeah. whatever I've been authorized to do. Uh, and, and relying on that, that single check at the time of log on or something uh, might mean that all these controls and all these systems that you've built, and whether you've gone overboard and, lim and limited who gets to order uh, pencils with erasers on them versus pencils without erasers on them, uh, or, or gone the other direction and said, look, you can order office supplies, enjoy, or order anything. Uh, either way, uh, you've, you've basically opened the door to all of that, and you might as well not have done it uh, if you are relying on credentials that are submitted automatically by the browser uh, to carry that delegation around for you. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to wrap this up because we have closing remarks in the ballroom upstairs, and I know everybody wants to go. It's probably your o'clock.
<laughs> but thank you all for, for participating in the discussion. That's what made it really useful, and uh, I suspect you're going to have to be giving out business cards. <laughs>